For months, ever since the current health crisis began, top scientists from around the world have been saying that uh, herd immunity is the best approach to this, uh, as opposed to having a blanket full lockdown policy to deal with it in a black and white way. And uh, whereas the, the UK government, with, uh, with the advice of uh, Neil Ferguson, Professor Lockdown, the architect of this policy, who was fired because he broke the lockdown measures himself. Now, he's come out and admitted that Sweden's approach was the right way because, uh, at worst, it gave a similar outcome without destroying the economy and risking more lives, and at best, it, uh, it would uh, provide a better result. Now, Neil Ferguson, who uh, became known as Professor Lockdown after convincing Boris to uh, obviously uh, do this policy, has now said that despite relying on quite similar science, the Swedish authorities had uh, got a long way to the same effect without a full lockdown. So in this video we are joined uh, by Christopher Snowden from uh, the Institute of Economic Affairs to talk about this and uh, a number of other issues. Right, so now we're joined by Christopher Snowden from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Uh, welcome to the show, Christopher. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Nice to be here. How's the lockdown treating you? <laughs> um, well, better than it has a lot of people, really. Yep. I, I do most of my work from home anyway. Yep. Um, so, yeah, it's it's millions of other people, really, I feel sorry for who are stuck in a, in a small flat or are going to get made redundant very soon. Yeah. Um, you guys have been, uh, I mean, people like yourself have been quite busy with this whole, uh, since the lockdown started, in terms of the practicality of it, uh, how we should scrutinize it, what's going well, what's going badly. Um, we just had, obviously, um, Neil Ferguson, uh, the professor lockdown, uh, coming out to admit that uh, Sweden used the same science. Even though these are the same people who always say we shouldn't compare Sweden to the UK, but then they're now comparing Sweden to the UK and saying that, um, but it seems like without strict kind of um, lockdown uh, policies, uh, Sweden achieved the same thing as we did anyway. Um, what do you think of this whole thing? And Neil Ferguson? Well, I mean, it's true that they use the same science. If you want to use the word science for what is was basically a theory and a strategy. Yeah. Um, initially, the Swedish and UK approach was identical. Um, the idea was to, essentially they treated it like flu. I mean, that's the important thing I think people need to recognize. All the UK's pandemic preparations for years have been focused almost entirely around influenza, mm -hmm. despite the fact that we have had things like SARS and MERS, which are, are closer to the current virus than, than flu. Now, flu comes around every year, obviously, and it's very likely that you, you're going to get a particularly severe dose of it from time to time. Yep. So it obviously makes sense to plan for it. But they, when the COVID-19 came along, they just implemented the influenza plan. And so did Sweden, effectively. And with influenza, you, you accept that you're not going to contain it, that a lot of people are going to get it, quite a few people are going to die from it. Mm. And therefore, it's just a matter of managing it. And that is what Sweden has been doing with, with COVID-19. And it has had more deaths than its Nordic neighbours as a result. Um, the UK had the same approach and then it changed its mind in mid-March. And a lot of the controversy and interest from my point of view is why they made that change. Mm. And the kind of emerging narrative, the popular myth about it is that the government was just merrily going along, not wanting to do anything about this, let loads of people die and, you know, let God sort them out. And then Neil Ferguson and the scientific community came together and basically forced the government's hand. It's simply not how it works. Uh, how it worked. Um, the government was following what people like Neil Ferguson and the other members of SAGE and Chris Whitty and Patrick Vallance and all these scientific advisors. They were the ones who were implementing the influenza strategy, which you, if you want to call it a herd immunity strategy, yeah. you can do because herd immunity ultimately is the only way that um, you you end the, the spread of the disease. Um, and then there was a lockdown, which no one had really modeled, including Ferguson. Uh, people like Ferguson had modelled fairly stringent measures, a lot of social distancing and cocooning the elderly, but not not the lockdown that we've got. I mean, Ferguson still expected most people to be going to work, for example. Hmm. He was pretty hesitant about closing schools because it would prevent a lot of people going from uh, going to work. Um, so this idea of a lockdown was never in any any of the plans, wasn't in the, the SAGE planning, wasn't in the prior influenza pandemic planning of Public Health England and the NHS. It came about out of a sense of panic. 
uh, out of a sense that other countries were doing it. Yep. Once Italy did it, it, it really opened up that policy space. And it was a response to public pressure. And that's not to say it was necessarily the wrong thing to do, mm-hmm. nor does it necessarily mean that the previous planning for influenza was the right thing to do. I mean, COVID-19 clearly is a more potent disease than, than uh, COVID-19, uh, than influenza. Um, but that's why the strategy changed and people need to acknowledge that it wasn't some mad herd immunity scheme devised by dominic cummings that was eventually and belatedly superseded by a much more sensible approach of total lockdown of the economy for 11 weeks and counting yeah i feel like um there was a lot of media pressure on this and i think governments specifically the uk government uh, with this whole approach of uh, the way they did the lockdown feels like they turned uh, the the actual disease into a political enemy and made it look like, uh, so an enemy is attacking, so it's black and white. We have to basically just completely defeat it. I, I don't think that the way that scientists start talking about it, it's not like this thing is going to go anywhere. It's you know just going to have to live with it, uh, like any other uh, thing that um, was created. Um, so I, I think this, this approach that, you know, just black and white, a lot of people, like, you have to be either pro-lockdown or against lockdown. If you're against lockdown, that means you want people to die. Uh, that's kind of ridiculous. Uh, and it has... Um, created some issues with uh, the nanny state and Big Brother and uh, the, the kind of the police state. Uh, how do you think that's what, that whole thing's gone so far? And uh, it could have gone worse, by the way. But yeah. It could have gone worse, but it's been pretty extreme. Um, yeah. I mean, Boris Johnson himself said that these are the most draconian measures any government has mm. brought in in this country in peacetime or in wartime. And I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the restrictions, certainly that we were living under until a week or two ago, were more severe than anything people had to put up with mm. uh, during the war, which is not to say that you'd rather be living during the war. Obviously, you, you've been as well. Um, but in terms of the restrictions on individual movement, they're, they're off the scale. You know, and I have been a little bit uh, perturbed by the lack of resistance to it. I should say that I was in favor of the lockdown myself in in late March. I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. I even wrote an article in early March for The Telegraph saying that there's nothing necessarily illiberal Mm -hmm. about even quite stringent measures such as lockdowns, because we're dealing with harm to others. Essentially, we're dealing with a threat to life from other people that the collective can only deal with collectively um and so i didn't think that there was anything massively anti-libertarian about the lockdown funnily enough however as it becomes a new normal yeah things change and so i was in favor of it initially i could understand the reasons for extending it for another three weeks but beyond that point when Mm. the nhs clearly was not going to be overwhelmed which let's never forget was the only reason boris johnson gave us on the 23rd of march for doing this um the tables are now being turned in a very worrying way and that it is up to people who want to relax the lockdown to prove that it is safe to do so. And we're now talking about or fretting about things like people going on a beach, uh, about opening schools to a minority of pupils in and only in primary schools. I mean, it wasn't very long ago at all where the scientific advice was pretty clear on outdoor gatherings not being an issue at all, really. Uh, you know, even football matches and mm-hmm. Cheltenham races apparently was not going to spread the disease. Now, that might not be right, yeah. but I don't think anybody even now seriously suggests that you're going to infect people when you're socially distanced on a beach in the sun. And yet there is now panic about this, mass panic about people going uh, down the beach or in, into into a park. Similarly, schools. Um, the evidence is mixed on this, but... There, there seems to be certainly no risk to children from from at all um, in, in schools or anywhere else and very, very small risk to teachers. And it's not clear at all, even in the handful of countries where there have been outbreaks um, that have led to some schools being closed again. It's by no means clear that, that it was the schools that caused them. I mean, surely you cannot expect not, not a single teacher to ever get seen once the lockdowns has begun. That doesn't mean that it's been an outbreak in the school. So we're being asked to, to yeah, a huge um, hurdle, a huge barriers being put in our way in getting back even a very, very small amount of the liberties that we gave up 11 weeks ago. Yeah, because uh, there's, uh, there's an aspect of it, which is kind of your civil liberties, individual liberties, but also economically, uh, post-recovery, uh, there's a chunk of people on the left or on the authoritarian side who want to take advantage of this uh, 
Uh, for example, move from the furlough uh, scheme into a, a universal basic income system uh, and uh, also a lot of other things too. Uh, do you think there's a danger that we might be able, I mean, even though I know we have a kind of kind of like a liberal conservative government with Boris Johnson in, in charge, but uh, considering they, are, they can easily be pushed around by the media pressure and, uh, you know, left-wing think tanks, is there a danger that we could actually go towards a more authoritarian uh, economically uh, system? I think it's possible, and certainly there'll be a conversation about those kind of things and conversation about the welfare state. And I guess people on the left will be saying forevermore that the government managed to pay the wages of 8 million people for several months. So why can't it end poverty or something like that? You know, yep. I mean, the, 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 the answer is pretty obvious. I mean, one, <laughs> one is a, a short term yep. crisis uh, measure, which is actually extremely expensive. And we're going to be in a lot of debt as a result of it. And one is kind of a, you know structural problems, which... Nobody knows how to solve. It will cost a vast amount of money that we don't have to even attempt to do so. The arguments for and against the universal basic income are not changed at all by this, as far as I can see. Um, I'm, I'm against the idea for the usual reasons. I just think it's, it's simply too expensive. And the only reason uh, a classical liberal would be in favour of it would be if you got rid of state-provided healthcare, education, mm. welfare, pensions, all the rest of it. If you did that then there's more of a case to be made. But I don't think the people on the left who are in favour of universal basic income yeah. have any intention of getting rid of those benefits in kind. They want it to be on top of benefits in kind, in which case it's just totally unaffordable and you'd be, be left with enormous marginal tax rates for, for those people who can be bothered to work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a big, it's a big danger. You know, it's a, there's a big danger both to... Um, you know, people who are concerned about economic freedom and also just basic civil liberties. Are we going to get all these liberties back? Why is Matt Hancock unilaterally deciding that this review period has gone from three weeks to four weeks? Mm. Well, apart from anything else, it suggests the next time they extend it, it's going to be for four weeks. That takes us into what, middle middle of July? <laughs> you know, and this is this has been done. I mean, I'm not one for this parliamentary scrutiny in this, really. I understand that yep. even if it was properly scrutinized, the, the MPs would wave all this stuff through. But nevertheless, there is surely a matter of principle here about the the government handing itself unbelievable powers and being able to renew them as many times as it wants. Mm. Uh, initially, every three weeks, now every four weeks, um, barely goes in, in front of Parliament. You know, the 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 uh, not Paris Act, but the the regulations that underpin the lockdown were introduced on i think the 26th of march when parliament wasn't sitting they were they came into effect an hour and a half before the thing was even theoretically laid before parliament it was supposed to be uh, debated and voted on within 28 hours it actually didn't get um, debated on at all until may mm. you know th this is not even you know even not, notwithstanding the fact that it's difficult to get mps together because of covid19 this is worrying stuff and my Frustration with the government is only really outweighed by my contempt for people like Piers Morgan and the people who are, who are, as far as I'm concerned, the Pied Piper, Pied, Pied, Pied Pipers of you know, economic depression. You know, and I think in the long term, people aren't really going to remember whether the UK had a higher death rate than Sweden or Italy had a higher death rate than France. The only real conversation about this for years to come is going to be the economic effects, the mass unemployment, the debt. That's what people are going to be talking about. Yeah. And I think when we look back, we'll say we should have eased the lockdown a hell of a lot sooner. I think there's there's a, a big battle of ideas coming up. You know, we were actually um, founded in 1955 as a, re as a direct re result of um, uh, our original founder being inspired by Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, which was published in 1944. Yep. And in that book, Hayek warns about the dangers of emergency wartime measures mm. being brought into peacetime. The idea that the state... Um, it was good enough to win the war and it took over large parts of the economy to do so. Therefore, why wouldn't it be good good enough to win the peace? Mm. And uh, he was obviously right about that. We, we, we then entered a, a long period of collectivization and socialism, which ended in tears, uh, debt and stagflation in the 1970s. And of course, there are, I think, parallels with that now, both on the economic side and on the civil liberty side. We must be absolutely... Um, dead set on reclaiming all of the liberties that we've given away in the last three months. And we must aim to get the economy back on track and, and make it a good liberal free market economy again. Brilliant. Well, no, th thanks very much. And thanks for coming on the show. Uh, hopefully we could uh, 
have a, a second conversation after this whole chaos in person. <laughs> yeah, sure. In about three years' time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Brilliant. Thanks for coming on the show. Bye. Okay, cheers.